Advisory Committee for your ongoing support to City Council and Park Board and our respective staff on gender equity issues. I am very fortunate to be part of this committee as the liaison from the Park Board. And I will mention that I'm, because it is a Park Board meeting night, both uh, Chair Weed and I will be having to slide out of here in a matter of just a few minutes because we have to be there by six. We have made great strides in our city to close the gender gap through our policies and programs, but much more needs to be done for women and girls in our community. Members of the Women's Advisory Committee are a very important link between the residents of our city, council members, and commissioners, so that we, the elected officials, are made aware of a much broader range of barriers faced by women and girls than we might be aware of or have encountered on our own. This awareness helps us make more informed decisions so that we can continue our mission of becoming an inclusive city for all regardless of gender. Now, not only does the Women's Advisory Committee help us make better decisions, but they've been instrumental in making this afternoon and evening's event happen. Chair of the Women's Advisory Committee for the last couple of years, Amanda Mandanero, will be tonight's moderator for the panel discussion. <coughs> We're grateful and honored that she has agreed to do this. And members of the advisory committee have set up a photo booth in the committee room one. And during the reception, all guests are invited to take part. You can just have a selfie, or you can have your photo taken with a written statement, uh, committing to yourself to bold actions that you will take to turn the dial on gender equality. Now it's my pleasure to say some words about Miranda Mandanero. And Miranda, in turn, as has been said, will introduce the panelists to you. So Miranda's been the chair of the Women's Advisory Committee at the City of Vancouver for two years, and in her most recent role as social performance analyst at Vince Rupert LNG, Miranda led gender and community engagement strategies. Prior to this, she was a research fellow for the Executive MBA in Aboriginal Business and Leadership Program at Simon Fraser University. There, she researched Indigenous entrepreneurship and economic development. Miranda has become well known for her work on the relationship between resource industries and gender. And she's a volunteer in these areas of women's rights, civic engagement, and entrepreneurship. Please join me in welcoming Miranda. Thank you. Thank you. We turn everyone's mics on so we're ready for the panel. Thank you. Commissioner Evans, thank you, Mayor Robertson. Uh, we are very lucky to have these five distinguished panelists with us today, and I'm honored to moderate uh, this very pertinent and important conversation. Um, as most of you are aware, and as you can tell, we never double checked our speeches, so there's going to be a little bit of crossover. <laughs> uh, March 8th is International Women's Day, and this week's International Women's Day marks the 106th one. While we may have made great strides in the last 106 years, we still have long ways to go to reach gender parity. It can be argued that the pace is far too slow and much more needs to be done. The World Economic Forum, as Councilor Bottle mentioned, predicts that gender gap won't close until 2186. That's 170 years from now. Uh, when we talk about the gender gap, we're talking about the fact that women face higher rates of violence than their male counterparts, that women get paid less for equal work, and that there is still a lack of women in leadership positions. While this is true for all women, it's important to note that it is even a more dire situation for certain groups of women, such as Indigenous women, women of color, and immigrant women. This large gap is the reason why each year we continue to celebrate the achievements of women. But as we all know, celebrating and raising awareness is important, but it's not enough. Tonight, we will talk about the bold actions that are currently underway and the ones that are still needed to close this gender gap at a quicker pace, because 107 years is far too long to wait. Tonight, we are joined by Karen Joseph, CEO of Reconciliation Canada, Shashma Dat, President and Founder of Spice Radio, Barbara Pierno, Executive Director of the Granville Island Culture Society, Janet Austin, CEO of the YWCA of Metro Vancouver, and Bob Elton, Chief Risk Officer of Van City. All of them have extraordinary bios and histories, which you all have in your program. I 
argued with myself if I should read them all out, because they are amazing, but I really am actually very eager to hear what they have to say about this topic. So for the sake of time, uh, I will encourage you to please read your bios, learn about all of them. They're doing amazing work in the community. They're pioneers in the work. We're so grateful for having them here. I'm so honored to be here on the stage with them. So each panelist will have five minutes to share their story and speak to what being bold for change means to them. How they have turned the dial on gender equity and what more needs to be done to close the gender gap. I will be keeping track of time and will signal when the five minutes is up. Once all five have spoken, if there's time, and we're hoping there will be about 10 minutes, we're going to discuss what more can be done to encourage more people to take bold actions with regards to gender equality. And what is the one thing each panelist hopes people do or take away from it after attending tonight's event. After which I'll wrap up the discussion uh, and as been told, we'll have a reception out in the foyer. During the panel discussion, please feel free to tweet out your thoughts, uh, ideas and actions using the hashtag COVWAC, so City of Vancouver Women's Advisory Committee, um, and hashtag Be Bold for Change. And then we'll be keeping track of those on our Facebook page. Okay, and with that, I'm very excited to hand it over to Shashma Dad. I am asked to, or invited to speak, my mind takes me to those forgotten moments that have helped me be what I am today. Last year, I celebrated 50 years in the broadcasting industry. I've always wanted to be a broadcaster ever since I was 10 years old. I dreamt to be a broadcaster. It was July 1966 that my very first program went on air in the BBC's Hindi service. During these 50 years, there have been many bold decisions and moments that I had to make, whether they were related to work or my personal life. I will not talk about all of them, but I'll talk about two of them. One at the start of my career, and the second one 34 years ago, which changed the trajectory of my life. I started as a typist with the BBC's Hindi service and soon moved to to a program post position. I also kept on doing typing. I had eight bosses. Seven of them were great mentors and quite a bit older than me. One of them was uh, my immediate superior and was six or seven years older to me. He would make me do all sorts of mundane jobs, like getting tea for everybody or go picking up lunch for everyone. While recording my weekly program one day, I made a mistake and I needed to clean it up. I didn't want to re-record it, so I asked him if he could help me. He was in the editing room editing his own club. I asked him how I could edit my speech without re-recording it. First he ignored me and continued editing. I stayed there, watched him closely. When he finished, I asked him again. You want to learn everything, he said? Yes, I said. He said, do your job that you've been hired to do, type in news, leave the programming and production to the experts. He said that and walked out of the room. How dare he, I thought. But now I'm thinking, how dare he. <laughs> it took me two years from that time onwards to then get into BBC's studio manager's program which taught you how to edit properly. I learned to be a studio manager, know how to edit, know how to balance music and vocals in the studio. I also continued my weekly program with the BBC even when I left the BBC and came to Canada in 1972. The bold moment, it was, you can't do it. Do what you are hired to do. So I learned to do the editing I wanted to. I came to Canada in 1972, a newly married bride, arranged marriage and all that. I made a personal bold decision in 1974 to leave my husband and be a single parent. A no-no in my community at that time, but this is a topic for another day, I won't talk about that. <laughs> Other than that, uh, training that I had at the BBC never duplicated here in its real avatar, I knew more than the Canadian broadcasters who were talent but were not technical operators. I managed to get a job as a night operator with CHQM FM in the 70s. Fast forward, leaving my radio station, I got into television and I was working for a pay television station, Worldview Pay TV, 
I got the opportunity to go to India and interview Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. The interview aired in Vancouver in April, Mrs. Gandhi attacked the holiest shrine of the Sikh faith, the Golden Temple in June, and 13,000 miles away in Vancouver, the repercussion of this act was felt by me. My TV station lost its subscribers and I lost my job. Out of a job, what to do? I had to give myself a job. I registered a TV production company in July 1984 and called it IT Productions Limited, which today owns two radio stations, Rim Jim and Spice Radio. There was a time when our company produced over 11 hours of TV programs a week for the South Asian community. My biggest help, of course, was my family and women of the community who believed in me. So, what was my motivation? Why was I able to do all that? I was sure of my capability as a broadcaster, as a producer, as a production assistant. If I had faith in myself, I could move forward. If I did not have faith in myself, I wouldn't have been able to do what I have been able to do today. When young men and women meet me and tell me that they've been watching me ever since they were tykes, and that I have in one way or another motivated them to realize their dreams, it makes me feel very good. So dance is my motto. Not really dancing, dancing, but the word D-A-N-C-E. D stands for dreaming, dream, dream what you want to do. A stands for acquire the skills to realize your dream. And for negotiating the acquired skills and nurture the dream. C for cultivating it and finally E for enjoying it. I know everyone's life is, in everyone's life, everyone faces difficulties and hard decisions. Our actions determine the outcome. No matter what field we are in, we never should give up. Be forthright, know what you want, and with focused determination, get it. The universe is really waiting for you to dream, and it is waiting to make every effort that your dream comes true. So, I would say, dream bold dreams. Thank you. Tashma has started off with her courageous and tenacious story. Um, and I mean, this is what uh, the world is about. Uh, women and men who have dreamed the changes they want to see and go and be bold in doing that. So thank you so much for your story. Uh, we will move on to Barbara. <laughs> thank you, the City of Vancouver, to all the city councillors, as well as the Parks Board and the Women's Advisory Committee. My esteemed panelists, I am honored to be here with every single one of you. We have to exchange business cards before we leave. <laughs> and of course, to our wonderful audience, I am quite honored to be here. Um, when asked the question about bold movements, um, I have to say I've made quite a number of them, but I didn't realize they were bold at the time. Um, because essentially, if there was a goal that I saw and I wanted to do it, I just went for it, including the fact that a huge, big, bold move was moving here from New York City. I am a proud dual citizen, um, but I was born and bred in Brooklyn, um, and I've been here now for 14 years. Armed with my bachelor's degree, I was working in marketing and insurance, and I thought that that was fantastic making a lot of money. I was working in the insurance capital of the world, Hartford, Connecticut. They moved me around the country and eventually moved me to their New York office. I had my own car. I had my own apartment. I thought everything was fantastic. And it was. I was pretty much very happy until I ran into an old teacher. And his name was Dr. Wayne Grove. And he asked, how was I doing? And I said, I'm doing great told him about my accomplishments. And he said, is this really what you want to do? Is, are the choices that you made, are those that would make you happy? 
And I was 20-something at the time and said, well, of course, you know. I've got my own money, I've got my own car, you know, I could break out into song if I were Beyonce. But I really had to think about that. And eventually I decided that it was a good thing to start volunteering. Volunteering, for me, has actually provided a huge foundation and it has changed my life. I started volunteering, the first thing was um, an electoral campaign for a, a guy who never made mayor of New York City, but it did help to change my life. And eventually I started volunteering in arts and culture. I became a stage manager. I had no idea what a stage manager was. And this was on the downtown, the, well, it's the Lower East Side of Manhattan, um, a place where quite a number of off and off, off Broadway plays either will rehearse or do a lot of training. After my first show as stage manager, I realized that I needed to be in arts and culture. Because after a collective project that you do with a group of people that you probably have just met, but you all have the same collective goal, even though you've met quite briefly, but the goal is the same. And to eventually have that goal realized through a live performance and to have this immediate family just created and then everyone disperses afterwards, but the feeling of accomplishment that was absolutely immediate was electrifying to me. So, while still working in marketing and insurance, I actually moved over to medical marketing with very large clients, I started to take technical theater classes and became a um, lighting technician. I was the only woman on the Lower East Side as a lighting technician. I started going to my office with a bag that had a wrench, jeans, flyers, and um, sneakers, just in case I ever got the call that there was a lighting tech that did not show up, and if I got the call, I was heading to the Lower East Side while I was doing my nine to five, also taking technical theater classes, learning how to build props, but also learning to focus on lights. And every once in a while, I actually did get a call. So um, one of those calls led me to do the lights for Dizzy Gillespie, Max Roach, Betty Carter, and Mongo Santa Maria, um, and a number of other really fantastic, fantastic musicians, because I was ready with my bag. Then I started taking tours across the United States as a stage manager. We would go from Chicago to Miami to Los Angeles to points all over while I was on vacation, still working my nine to five. And there was another point in terms of my bold movement. I wanted to transfer those skills to filmmaking. So I started taking film classes at New York University. And by this time, I had to let the marketing job go um, because I was working as a stage manager and also taking film classes and decided I was going to find a black woman filmmaker that I was going to be an intern with and to work with her so I could learn the business. There are quite a number of um, filmmakers, of course, in New York. A lot of them were Caucasian men. And when it came to sharing resources and sharing information, I was not part of that group, and getting that information was not going to be easy. A lot of times while we were in class, we would talk about shots, um, in terms of, not these shots, but <laughs> shots, camera shots, no one wanted to share the information. So I was able to connect with a filmmaker by the name of Ayoka Chinzera, who was, and still is, the first African-American um, woman animator and we eventually became business partners and were making films for 10 years for PBS, um, um, a feature, dance pieces, animated pieces and I got to travel the world with our films essentially going to festivals all over the planet which was absolutely wonderful and I got to learn the business of distribution of films because the difference in terms of what we wanted to do was not only get the film in the can but also to distribute the films because many filmmakers did not think along those lines. And my next bold movement was moving to Vancouver 
and the volunteering started all over again. The volunteering has been a wonderful foundation for me here. I was able to volunteer at the garden, um, the Van Dusen Gardens, but also had an opportunity to work at the Van City Theater as one of their theater managers. They actually brought me to New, um, from New York to make films for them, but worked for the Vancouver International Film Festival, and as you can see from my bio, quite a number of places um, beyond that, I was managing director of the Vancouver Folk Music Festival, didn't know anything about folk, but knew a lot about the logistics of putting together an event. That's what filmmaking taught me, that's what stage managing taught me, and I learned how to work with a great number of people. And also, what is important in terms of contributions of a face-to-face, -face, walking up to someone, intru introducing yourself, with your goal in mind, that is what has always been important to me and what has worked. My goal in mind when I meet people and decide to expand my network. And as a result of doing that, I've worked in quite a number of fantastic positions here at the City of Vancouver, including working for Vision Vancouver for um, a short period of time, which was really a, a wonderful experience for me. Now working as the executive director of the Granville Island Cultural Society, what is important to me is making sure that arts and culture, hopefully throughout the city, but in my little niche right now, I can say at least for Granville Island, that arts and culture is a reflection of this beautiful diversity that we live in. So since I've been there, um, I have created the Black History Month film series for the Vancouver International Film Festival, which is in its fifth year, doing really fantastic, bringing in films from all over the world. Also created um, with um, artists the International Day of the Dead um, ex exhibit and tour that is on Granville Island that helps to bring the Latino, Mexican culture to Granville Island to help um, to help express how important the Day of the Dead is um, to the Latino culture, to Mexican culture, and to share that it is much more than just skulls on a t-shirt along with beer. It is so much, it is so significant, and we've had so many um, from the Latino culture and from the Mexican culture that live here in Vancouver that have come to learn to love the event also very important in creating Vancouver's International Puppet Festival. It is um, coming along for its second year. And if there's anything that I can share in my closing moments, um, here is just walking up to people, extending your hand. Face-to-face -face, um, interactions have been the most important and the most effective to me in terms of expanding my network getting to meet people, and to continue to work in arts and culture, which I think is a public service. Thank you very much. Teaching your own life and teaching yourself the knowledge and skills that you need to get what you want. Very neat. Thank you. Um, Janet, I'll go over to you. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, um, I want to start um, by thanking uh, council, staff, and the Women's Advisory Committee for what I think has been outstanding leadership on advancing women's equality in so many different ways. And we are looking very much forward to the gender lens strategy that I know is in preparation and, and uh, commit to really provide the full support of the YWCA in, in executing it. So this is a really important topic, I think, for us at the YWCA. I think Canadian women enjoy a measure of legal equality, which is not enjoyed by most of the women in most of the countries around the world. But socially and culturally, we do have a long way to go. So the YWCA is committed to the full realization of women's equality, really across all dimensions in society. Um, and we know, I guess, from experience that advancing change inevitably requires boldness. And for boldness, I would read courage, because there's always resistance to change. Um, I'd like to say that I think this is particularly important now. This is a pivotal year uh, where many of the gains of recent years are actually under threat. And um, I think that in itself, courage and boldness is important, but it's not sufficient. Um, 
you know, there's not a day that goes by these days where we don't in some way uh, invoke the situation in the United States right now. And I think it's important that we continue to think about that in relation to the impact that it has on our own society, Canadian society, um, because many of the same preconditions exist here as well. Um, but I think in the United States, we see, I think, many examples of people who are boldly and vehemently expressing their opinions, but not enough um, listening to understand, and not enough thoughtful questioning to find um, common ground. So yes, courage is important, but I think we also need clarity on the end goals. Um, we need to understand what a strategic approach is, uh, and we need to build relationships and alliances and find common cause with others, sort of reach out across those boundaries and barriers that divide people in society and the economy. And sometimes I think we also need to have the ability to compromise and recognize that we, we may need to take incremental steps to actually achieve what our goal is. So my example is not a personal one, it's a YWCA one, and there's, I guess, many examples I could use from the YWCA, but it's about work that we started a number of years ago with respect to mothers without legal status in the country. So this is a problem identified at our front line, and these were Canadian women, um, uh, these were women with Canadian, sorry, these are women who came to Canada legally because they were in relationships with Canadian-born men, um, and they had children while they were here, so the, the children are actually Canadian citizens. Now, the relationships broke down due to violence, and in that situation, it's up to their sponsor, so these women were sponsored residents, it's up to the sponsor to maintain that sponsorship, and if they choose not to, the women would be in the country really with no legal status, which means that she wouldn't have the right to work, wouldn't have had the right to access any benefits, um, and in many cases uh, was unable to leave the country uh, with her children because the permission of the father was actually required. So there's a process involved there, but it's quite lengthy. So many of these women were, were without any support whatsoever, and we started to see this at the front line. We realized that this was a significant problem, um, and we needed to find a way to understand the dimensions of it. So. Uh, we were successful in getting a grant from the Law Foundation to look into the project, and we undertook a research. Uh, we released the report, but initially it kind of fell on deaf ears. And so we thought, well, we need to do something more to actually draw attention to this issue and see if we can drive some change. So we decided to use it as the focus of our, um, as our key focus for International Women's Day. And I had an editorial board meeting with the Vancouver Sun, they were very interested in it, and we knew they were going to give it significant coverage. However, I didn't want to damage relationships that I had worked very hard to develop with key provincial bureaucrats. And so what I did was I called the deputy minister responsible and said, here's the report, here's what it says. I would like to be able to say to the Vancouver Sun that we've had a very positive hearing and that we are working together to solve this problem. Can I do that? Right? And he said yes. And he was absolutely as, as good at, at, at his word. Um, he set up an ADMs committee. We worked with them to work through this issue. Um, initially, we dealt with women who had these challenges on an exceptional basis. Uh, but we actually worked to um, develop what is a substantive reform uh, in that we uh, were able to get a change to the income assistance regulation, which, which enabled um, which enabled the Ministry of Children and Family Development to grant income assistance to women in this situation when they could verify violence. So it was a, a great example of working collaboratively to get a change that provided, it really was a systemic change that addressed this issue for a, broad, a much broader range of women, so not just dealing it, with it on an exceptional basis. Uh, we were able to do a, a joint announcement. I, I announced it jointly with the Premier. Um, and, uh, um, and, and so that was a very successful, I think, win-win, where I think we were able to incent the province to understand the benefit of doing what we were recommending. So that's my example, I think, of trying to move, move through um, achieving real change, um, not only just by boldness, but by being thoughtful um, and creative with strategy, by working with alliances, and having a clear focus on your end goal. So that's my probably out of time, hey? Eh?
Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll just say one more thing. This is, I think, just one example of uh, many things that we're currently doing at the YWCA. And, and without going in, into any detail, I want to draw attention to, I guess, four things that are top of mind for us right now. We're working on an organization-wide reconciliation strategy, uh, looking at how we can use our organization to amplify some of the excellent work of other organizations, but also how we can institutionalize a reconciliation culture across all dimensions of our work. Um, we're going to be doing, um, uh, with the BC Council, the Ismaili Council for BC, um, a session on Islamophobia, um, perhaps to address some of the contemporary challenges that we're all concerned about. Uh, and then we're doing work on sexualization of girls and women and hypermasculinization of men and boys. And my colleague Chantelle Krish is here and she's leading that work. Um, people understand, I think, the challenges for things like um, you know, body image and self-esteem, but they don't understand the profound relationship with violence against women. So we're bringing um, focus to that as well. So thank you very much for the opportunity to join you today. Um, and I think it's really also important to know that with gender issues, we do have to focus. Although today we're highlighting women, um, there is challenges with boys and how we're raising boys and how we're expecting them to show masculinity. So, thank you. Um, we will move on to Bob now. Thanks very much. Again, thank you to the City of Vancouver and councillors and, and the mayor and so on for, for leadership in this area and, and for the advisory council. So I've got a different story, obviously. Um, so I'm, I'm the one on the other side of the picture that, that in some cases, in other words, I was born into a privileged group, the most privileged group, the group of, of white men. Uh, and growing up, my, what I remember the most is that my dad and my older brother uh, did most of the talking in the house, and my mother did not really have a voice. Although, uh, I love reading, and that's one thing. That's the biggest thing, probably, that I got from either of my parents, and I got that from her. Uh, my first job was with PwC, accounting firm, and in Manchester, England, and included in the group of ten of us was the first woman I'd ever hired in a professional capacity in the office. And so we all, get to know, we all got to know her, we knew that she was probably the best of us, and we knew that she had by far the hardest, uh, the hardest uh, job. So I, I decided around about that time, this was not a bold decision, being a privileged person, you don't have to make bold decisions really throughout your life. Uh, I decided that I would obviously A, try to have a good career, and B, I would focus on the issue of gender equity throughout that career, wherever I was. So I'll just tell, I'll just give one example, fairly short. Uh, when I was at BC Hydro, I was the CEO there. And it was a typical, uh, typical leadership group, typical workforce, the leadership group was about 10% women, both management team and uh, top 100 positions. And all of those women were in non in L roles, as, as I kind of got maybe older and maybe a little bit wiser. That's the key thing that I now like hope to see and want to see in every conversation that I have. And, what, and, what, and one of the conversations that we made sure we had was if people wanted to, for example, pick a team to do a really important project, and it was a bunch of guys, uh, you know, I just asked them, what is the argument for homogeneity in this case? And interestingly, when you frame it that way, it was usually a short conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we also changed our criteria for leaders to be to include the criteria of emotional maturity. When we did that, it automatically meant that we, funnily enough, ended up earning more money. <laughs> I don't my own way. So, we, and I think we got we got great results. I think it was very successful. In other words, again, I'm not you know I, I never talked about it. I never said to the organization we were doing that, we just kind of did it. And of course, as time went on, people got used to it. Men and women got used to it, and they enjoyed it. We talked about values a lot, which meant that we were talking about ourselves as people a lot. We got better. Of course, part of it's promoting and, and hiring and putting women on big projects. Part of it is that when you do that, you have the conversation. The conversations have to be different. And I, I remember some great conversations, particularly about safety, that became so much more personal and that helped us incredibly in terms of understanding what we needed to do about human behavior so that people would behave more safely in the workplace in, in a very tough, very traditional male environment. The part that we, we that I don't think we did enough of, that I, in, re, in reflection, wish that I had done more of, was 
I never talked to the organization. I talked about values a lot to the organization. I never talked about the effect that this had on me as a leader. I never talked about the fact that I was so much better at thinking through things, understood so many more things, uh, came to think, came to complex issues with just a different lens because there was a variety of people in the group. I never did that. I do it more now, actually. Uh, the results, I mean, one result of it, of course, as I say, I believe very strongly we, we made some great decisions which, which will live on in the future. Another result was that there was a, a, a relatively large number of senior women that, that flourished during that time, and either they're still there, flourishing, or they've gone somewhere else. Three of them became CEOs of other organizations. Very proud of that. Um, the final thing, I guess, is, is just, in, just in terms of, of what I've learned from all of this, as my thoughts have evolved, is I don't try and have conversations anymore with women where I think I'm mentoring them. Um, I don't advise any of my male colleagues to do that. I have conversations with women more where I'm figuring out what I can learn from them. And I think actually, if we're going to make the progress we need to do, that's really what we need to do. This isn't about quotas and it's not about you know, social justice, of course it is, but it's also about simply we need more women at the table in all situations, in all walks of life. And so that's my story. for the men in the room with the importance of men as advocates, champions, sponsors, but more importantly, role models to other men and women on how men should be supporting women to get to the places they want to be. So thank you, Kyle and Matt. Um, also, I think the really pertinent point of how equality makes us all stronger for people and organizations. So. <coughs> and last not, but not least, and by request, I should like <laughs> like to point out, um, <laughs> we would like Karen Joseph to speak. Thank you for that. Um, what an amazing group to to be sitting at, at the table with here also. Astonishing. I'm, I'm really humbled to be here. I um, it's, it was kind of funny. I, I came here thinking one thing, and, and after hearing all of you speak, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to share something different. Um, I'm going to say this because I, I most of what I what I'll share with you today is is things I've learned from other people. And I and I had a conversation with a with a with a young indigenous woman. And uh, and I looked at this question, what was your bold moment? And I think from that perspective, the bold moment is getting up every day. The bold moment is is showing up every day. The bold moment is, is another story that I heard of where you think about the fact that we are the women our ancestors prayed for. And so given all of those realities, every moment presents, and every day presents an opportunity to be bold in who we are. And I think the bolder pieces for me personally on, on my journey is recognizing my own inherent strength and my own inherent wisdom that has been passed on from generation to generation by virtue of being in the room, by virtue of, of listening to those old people as they tell their stories, by virtue of, of showing up when they're doing the canning and, and being a little child and, and sitting there in the room and wondering how these men were old ladies, probably younger than me, you know, when you're young, you think they're older than me. But uh, how these old ladies could know so much. And, uh, and they would continue to teach us. And I think, you know, one of the other realities of, of where we come from, especially as an indigenous woman in this society, and it, and it was it was alluded to in the in the um, in the pro proclamation. So I really want to acknowledge the, the women that that helped craft the wording of that. Um, I don't know too many Indigenous women. I don't know too many women in general, but certainly too many Indigenous women that have not come through this life and experienced sexual violence. That's just a reality for us. 
And so how do you overcome that? How do you overcome that to recognize who you are and what your strengths are? And to recognize that you're more than the actions that have been perpetrated upon you. That from that place of hurt and from that place of violence, that you can grow this incredible strength, this incredible capacity to influence people. You, talk, you talked about uh, emotional intelligence. <coughs> when you've gone through those realities, when you've lived through those realities, and like that young indigenous woman said, you choose to get up every day. You, you bring with you, and this is for any woman, you, you bring with you a poise into the room that nobody can ever take away. And I think for me, my greatest strength actually comes in my vulnerability. And my ability to share those stories and to try to create understanding amongst people. And try to create, to recognize, create a safe space where we can recognize our common humanity. Where we can recognize that we have shared values. Where we can recognize that we have love for our families and for our children and that we have dreams and aspirations. And that's not unique to men and that's not unique to women. That's unique to humanity. And so those are the places I think where, where my own journey has taken me. And the bold step for me really was starting to embrace that. Was, was starting to embrace it, starting to articulate it, and to open up my heart in that courageous and vulnerable way to other people and say, I don't know everything, but I know what I know. And I know I need you. And I know I need you. And I know I need you. And, and I know that together, we can do something better than we could have ever done on our own. And that the other thing that I probably learned is that the people are not the system. And so, especially as an Indigenous woman, we're so run by systems. We're, our, our status cards are not having a status card, whether you're on reserve or you're off reserve. We're so defined by external systems. And if you think how many people work within those systems, well, those people aren't the system. Those people are the ones that are trying to implement the systems and trying to do their job so they can have their dreams and their aspirations and all of those things. But that doesn't necessarily mean they share the same values of those systems. So as we're trying to create systems change, not just for women, but for all people, starting to pull out what are their values, what are their shared values, what are our shared values. We all have mothers. Some of us have sisters. Some of us have daughters. Some of us have grandmothers. You know, you think you know so much in life. And probably for me, the greatest learning opportunity, and I never thought it would happen to me, because I never thought I had the capacity to be a mother, was when I became a mother at an older age in life. And the lessons, day after day after day, that that young soul brought to me about love, about curiosity, about courage, about sharing, about dreaming, about possibilities. And so for me, those are the, some of the bold decisions I think is, is starting to understand those realities for me as an individual, for me as an indigenous woman, for me as a, a woman who's who's uh, in a same-sex relationship, for me, who's a, a mother who's not necessarily the biological mother of my child, for, for me, who's the eldest daughter of a hereditary chief, for me, who is all of these things that says that I shouldn't be here today. And yet I am. But you don't get to these places by being hard. I haven't gotten to these places by being hard. I've gotten to these places by being courageous. I've gotten to these places by recognizing our common humanity and opening myself up to more learning and more teaching and more possibilities. And so I'm, I'm really humbled by the opportunity to, to be here today, to, to sit with all of these amazing leaders that we have here, and 
to think about where we can go, not just as women, but as a society that embraces women, that embraces that wisdom, that embraces that strength, that embraces that courage and that love and that passion and that, that we bring forward. So with that, that I thank you for the opportunity. especially when we're doing this work um, with, with, with women's rights and human rights, it's really hard and it can make you harder. So I think it's the importance of having love and compassion and shared values. I think it's amazing. So thank you. Um, we will end off with one question for everyone to answer on the panel. Um, we are going to say, what is the one bold action each panelist hopes that the people in the audience take away and do from hearing your stories and being inspired by all of you? As they know they are, they were all captivated in each uh, story. We will start in the same order that uh, we started the talk. I'm going to put Shishma on the spot. <laughs> what was the one bold action you would like everyone in the audience to go away with today? I think um, listening to everyone has it sort of, um, you sort of come out of your own little cocoon and you look at other people and you say, wow. You know, um, you're not the only one who's gone through problems and troubles in life. Everybody else, in their own way, experiences that. And I think, I think understanding other people, the, the bold decision that everyone needs to make is, if I have a neighbor who is not I'm going to talk about Indian, not Indian, but is non-Indian. It's me who should go, be bold, and say to them, who are you? I want to know more about you. So that we know about our neighbors, we know about what they are um, facing, what they want to uh, do in life, and how you can. Um, be a conduit to help them. And I think that, I think that I would like to be. I would, of course, be talking to all of them. I have to absolutely agree with what you what you just said, um, and I try to do that and hopefully people here get a chance to try to do that through the arts. The arts actually allow you to take, um, to listen to stories, to appreciate various um, cultural events, significant dates that are appreciated or are shared by your neighbors that may not be like you. Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful way to learn about your neighbors, um, more about your community, and if there's any bold action that you have an opportunity to um, take part in. If there's an event that's either specifically Latino-focused, um, Black-focused, Asian, Indigenous, that you don't know anything about, and you have an opportunity to learn, take it. <coughs> take that chance, because the more we get to learn about our neighbors, we learn about the similarities that we have, and people don't feel as far away and as distant and as different as you may think they are. We have many more similarities than we have differences. So if there's any bold action there, that's my suggestion. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, so there's, I think there's not one thing for everybody, but what I would say is to, Put some thought into what is the change that you would most like to see? So what is the what is the thing that is most important to you on this topic? And then make it a practice every day to talk to one other person about it. But when you're having that conversation, don't always pick the people who are in your circle, you know, the people who share your views, because they'll just be reflected back to you. And ultimately, you'll only be speaking to yourself, right? So make a sincere effort to reach out to others who don't share your views. 
whose life is, experience is different. Um, and, and it's not just about you talking to them, it's about really sincerely trying to understand their point of view, to listen to their point of view, and truly engage, and hopefully find some common ground, some common cause. Janet, what do you Sure. So a bit on the same theme, and I'm going to maybe, again, take a risk. So I'm, I'm going to, this may be mainly for the men in the room, um, but for me it would be what they said. Uh, but pick someone that you think you're better than. Pick someone that you think you're smarter than, or more accomplished than, or wiser than, or uh, quicker in thought than, and have a conversation with them, which is a learning conversation. I'm going to make this really practical uh, because I wouldn't be here without it. Um, if you're in a position of influence, uh, sponsor, advocate for, advance somebody else, uh, especially a woman who doesn't have those same opportunities as you. It's amazing how often we don't create that space. And quite frankly, I would not be here were it not for some significantly influential uh, individuals who, who happen to continue to put my name forward. And uh, I, I wouldn't be sitting in this room, um, and, and some of the people in this room know this. I, I started out uh, on this journey uh, by attending Minerva's Women, uh, Helping Women Work, and then went into Women Leading the Way, and then did a whole bunch of other things. So I think advancing the opportunities for women uh, within your organizations is critical to this group set. And I would say a very practical tool. Okay. I think there's some great themes that come out of all that, so thank you all to the panelists. I think being bold, uh, courageous, and tenacious to activate change is the one common theme in everyone's story. Um, the importance of role models and champions, um, and that every day for us a chance to be bold, which ties nicely into the ending I had planned for this uh, part of the panel. And it's our actions that make young girls and boys believe that certain jobs are for a certain gender, certain thoughts and actions are okay, it's up to each of us to change our behaviors our, and challenge our own thoughts and beliefs to ensure our world allows for all people to have the same access to all opportunities. But with that, I encourage everyone after this is done to head over to clean room number one, put down your bold action that you commit to to make this the world a better place. Get your picture taken so we can upload on Facebook. And I look forward to hearing all about the actions when I see people in the street. And you can find us on our Facebook page and the Women's Advisory Committee at City of Vancouver. So thank you again, and please join me in thanking all of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, and especially all of our guests from the Councilor Corps who have come from all over the world tonight to join us on this very important event. So thank you for being here. And uh, I think we'll all be bold as we move out into the foyer for the reception.